Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar. I, I see that people are still coming in the room. So just a few seconds to let everybody join in and, and settle in. So just while folks are um, getting uh, ready, uh, first I wanna welcome everybody uh, to this webinar entitled Health and All Policies in Times of COVID-19, Wellbeing, Economics and Social Protection. Uh, my name is Marianne Jacques. I'm, um, I'm a scientific advisor at the National Collaborating Center in, for Healthy Public Policy uh, in Canada. And I'm also coordinator for the Global Network for um, Health and All Policies. Uh, this webinar was organized by the Tampere University in Finland uh, with the support of the Global Network and the WHO. Uh, so before we begin, just a few housekeeping information. Uh, if you have any technical issues, please let us know through uh, the chat box. And uh, Milen is here with us to help us out with any uh, issues. Um, and the webinar is planned for an hour and a half. And um, so, yeah, uh, if you have any questions uh, targeted to the speakers, please use the Q&A uh, option at the bottom of your screen. Uh, to uh, convey questions. If you have other general messages or if you want to share any resources, please use the chat box to do so. Um, finally, uh, please note that this webinar is recorded. Also, uh, everything that's uh, mentioned in the chat and in the Q&A is also recorded. So just be aware of that while you're typing in uh, any comments or questions. Um, and so before we dive into the core of the webinar, uh, I will pass uh, the mic to Mary uh, Koivusalo, Professor of Global Health Policy at Tampere University for some opening remarks. Thank you and enjoy the webinar. Uh, thank you and dear all, uh, welcome to, to the webinar. Uh, we are very grateful to be able to have this great collaboration uh, and audience in the webinar. I'm. Um, uh, from Tampere University, where I'm a uh, professor of global health and will introduce the seminar purpose and the speakers, while research director Laura Kokkinen from Tampere University will draw some points uh, for further consideration in the end of the seminar. Our webinar seeks to cast a critical uh, focus on the limits and potential of intersectoral measures uh, for health and social determinants of health. Economics and labour market policies are difficult ones for these aims and yet they are crucial uh, uh, for health and well-being. We will try not only to have a look on how health in all policies and action on social determinants of health have become applied, but also uh, how broader public policies matter, uh, including social protection, and influence how health sector itself can operate under uh, pandemics. Uh, do we need a more strategic focus on health in all policies approach, how much public policies are framed by scope for government intervention in general, and have also Nordic welfare state becomes shaped by broader economic and labor market practices. We have five speakers today, each presenting a particular perspective for the challenges ahead, combining different disciplinary and strategic starting points. Uh, we hope they will provide reflection not only on limits and potential, uh, but as well strategic choices and broader context of health in all policies practice, not only with respect to pandemics, but as well uh, preparing for the economic consequences of the pandemic, uh, politics of recovery and implications for public policies for health and well-being uh, in future. So uh, I'll just very shortly uh, present the speakers and, and, and their talks. And first we'll have uh, Elizabeth Foss, uh, who's a professor uh, of health promotion in Bergen University in Norway, and she will present an overview how Nordic welfare states address pandemic, where were the weak points and how broader welfare state policies related to the impact uh, of the pandemic. For Kearney, a professor of politics and public policy from Stirling University will then cast a critical focus on the political and governance challenges in implementation of health in all policies and what it can deliver in practice. Uh, we then go uh, to more to economic 
and uh, Professor Aske Andersen from the Center for Economic Behavior and Inequality in Copenhagen will take us to comparison between pandemic measures and impact of public health measures on economy in Denmark and Sweden, highlighting the importance of understanding implications arising not only from uh, public health measures, but by the pandemic uh, itself. And then Professor Ulla Lundberg from Stockholm University, who is known for his research on health equity and social determinants of health, will take a critical focus on the extent to which efforts on social determinants of health in Sweden uh, reduced inequalities and how, what are the ways to look forward uh, uh, with the new public health plan and, uh, and, and how it has sought to engage uh, with equity through focus on key areas within the society. We also have a final speaker, uh, uh, Heli Hattonen, uh, who will kind of uh, draw a bit of attention uh, to the practice uh, of um, health in all policies and, and, and economics of well-being. She's been placed in the executive seeking uh, to both revitalize the Finnish focus on health in all policies, as well as engage more uh, with well-being economics in practice. She's hopefully, uh, she will hopefully report on both challenges and potential uh, of working under the executive offices uh, uh, as part of the whole government efforts. And uh, I would also finally uh, like to introduce our wonderful facilitator, Nicole Valentine, in charge of uh, health in all policies and social determinants of health in WHO. She's got a background in economics and public health, and she will be the right person to tell a bit more on what is uh, health in all policies for the larger audience, and where are the current efforts to revitalize focus on social determinants of health in WHO. Nicole, please, uh, the floor. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to facilitate the discussion. Um, so, as Mary said, before we launch into the presentations, I just wanted to say a brief word on how WHO's work on health in all policies and the social determinants of health has evolved in recent years. In the past two years, there's been a reinvigoration of this area driven by a transformation process at WHO that has expressly carved out a new division that's focusing on health promotion and disease prevention through addressing social, economic, and environmental factors influencing population health and health equity. So that is on the one hand. And then further to this, the COVID-19 pandemic has also brought into sharp relief the interaction between the different living and working conditions for less advantaged population groups, and then the consequent increased risk of exposure to the virus as well as the, the consequences um, of, of infection uh, from the virus. So building on these developments, just last Friday, the member states of the WHO Executive Board, in fact, passed a resolution on the social determinants of health. And it's the first resolution on this uh, in almost a decade. And that will be proposed to the 2021 World Health Assembly. This resolution strongly urges that member states scale up action using whole of society and health and all policies approaches. Um, many of the member states when voicing support for the resolution also called on um, called for greater opportunities for exchange and learning between countries. So acti activities like being provided through the global network for health and all policies is a welcome such platform for exchange. The discussions we have here today, I think will help to foster the spirit of learning about action. So please be part of that fostering, be ready to ask questions and engage with our speakers and with each other on this important topic. Um, so that's really all that I'm gonna say now, please feel free when you want to put questions in, put them in the Q and A. If you want to make general statements, as Marion said, just uh, put them in the chat. But please uh, be as active as you can be. Um, and now I'm going to turn to our first speaker. And I'm delighted to turn over um, the screen to Elizabeth Fosse. Elizabeth, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll try to share my presentation. Mm -hmm. mm. Here we go. Uh, good afternoon, everybody from Norway. It's now afternoon. I want to make a presentation that is focusing on the role, particularly of the kind of Nordic uh, model in this. It's part of a Nordic 
a collaboration between Nordic colleagues. And obviously, these are sort of early days. So we have been working for this on this for six months and we are changing all the time. So this is at least just take this as a world preliminary uh, perspective or up for discussions, of course. So I called my presentation COVID-19, a challenge to the Nordic model. And the Nordic welfare model, that is sort of traditionally in the writings of uh, Just Esping Andersen, he's called it the social democratic welfare regime. And they were based on principles of solidarity and universalism and what is called a decommodification of rights. Behind that is the social democratic model. There is also the ideology of reducing social inequalities through a, a progressive tax system and also universal tax funded welfare and health services. Uh, uh, the Nordic countries also are characterized by a high degree of social cohesion and also a general confidence in government and authority. So this is very much what the ideal model of how the Nordic countries are being presented in literature. But over the yeah, last decades, there are also some challenges, mostly because a turn of policy in the direction of neoliberalism with an emphasis on deregulation, privatization and globalization. And what we see is also, uh, despite of this long tradition of reducing social inequalities, uh, social inequality has increased over time in all of the Nordic countries and are now relatively sort of much higher and than, than, they, than they used to be. Uh, so, of course, this ideal version of the Norway Nordic uh, model is not really uh, really up to date. But the social determinants of health is very important in an approach to health and all policies. It is, of course, the acknowledgement of all sectors of society should reduce in focusing on health and reducing social inequalities in general, and also in health. And in a, in a recent project, a colleague and I, we found that all the Nordic countries all the five Nordic countries that have policies in place that acknowledge the social democrat, social determinant of health, and also aims for a health and all policies approach, which means in this context that I see not only the health sector, but all sectors of society in important in reducing social inequalities in health. And these were national policies that we studied in that project. And uh, if we look at then, is there a sort of the, the project I'm involved in is we have the overall question, is there a Nordic uh, typical response to the COVID-19? Uh, and what we see actually is that because it was a uh, hypothesis that uh, countries who have exactly these uh, sort of characteristics of the Nordic countries, particularly social cohesion, confidence in the government and also that there's a high degree of public spending that that would be important in tackling the uh, 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 pandemic. And what we see in the Nordic countries that there are restrictions but also a high degree of recommendation. So the population is expected to follow these recommendations in order to reduce the spread of the pan pandemic. In, there's a strong focus on solidarity. I would say that the new word, the, the, the main word, the new word of 2020 in Denmark was the word uh, sin, which means that there is an attitude with an interest to over to, to the interest of your, uh, your common citizen and not uh, selfishness. And also that the population is expected through these uh, recommendations and to, um, restriction to comply with the rules and recommendation. And what we see is that also that the participation have mainly followed these rules, rules and recommendations in the Nordic countries. And if you look at what, what went well so far, our project is studying, we don't really know yet, three, four, five first months, but, uh, and, and what we see that all the Nordic countries has 
uh, included a multi-sectoral approach. That is not only the health sector uh, that is uh, have are uh, the, are sort of uh, are not only not measures in the health sector, but there has really been also a strengthening of multi-sectoral collaboration at particularly at the national level in the Nordic countries. And also that public health and health motion were included in the assessments and also how, how uh, the weight between the different measures, restrictions and recommendation has been sort of what, what have been prioritized. And also we can see that on the basis of these welfare arrangements, it where they were expanded, for example, unemployment benefits in all the countries were strengthened so that it would, that there were, uh, the rules were um, much more generous than they used to be, and also for a longer period of time than it used to be. And there are also been this special concern for vulnerable groups, uh, and particularly children and frail elderly has been, been um, pointed to as the important group to protect. If you look at what failed, we see that there is a lack of capacity in treatment. Um, at the beginning, but that is that was uh, the protection, uh, protection equipment, test capacity, and so forth, were uh, were lacking. Not even not only in the Nordic countries, but all throughout Europe. But we can say that Finland and Iceland were actually better equipped than the other countries because they had storages. Uh, what we see also in all the countries, but it's particularly particularly emphasized in Sweden because they have a report uh, recently showing that particularly older people in care homes were not protected because of very high death rates uh, in, in, in the care homes and uh, particularly in the first phase. And also we see there is a, a really strong social inequalities and who are being hit people in low paid occupations were harder hit. They cannot have like working from home like we can. They have professions that are uh, the demand that they are working. They can be working in shops, taxi drivers, bus drivers, uh, cleaners and so forth. And how should we explain this failure? I think that if we go of the causes of the causes more, then we would see particularly in concerning this, this uh, failure in, in, uh, in, in some of the care homes is that uh, there has been an undermining of the Nordic model, particularly uh, demonstrating increase in neoliberal labor market arrangements, which means that the steady job, full-time job are sort of less, uh, less available at the moment, like in the elderly homes, many are working on hourly contracts and so forth. And that was particularly, uh, yeah, as I said, in the, in the care homes. But also uh, the lack of equipment storage was explained by the globalization of trade, that this is something that we don't need to have. We're sort of only thinking that this should be in the market, which also led to a kind of quite an ethical competition for this equipment uh, during the springtime. How, what can we learn so far? I think that even in, uh, I listened to the debate, uh, particularly in Norway and Sweden, and also in the group, that this acknowledgement of the importance of sustainable governance and social cohesions are really being undermined. So in Norway, we have a conservative government who's kind of been actually moving away from a rhetoric about privatization and deregulations, because the pandemic has showed how important it is to have that government is, uh, is we have a coherent government as well. And it also led to increased criticism against privatization of health and care service, particularly these um, uh, labor uh, uh, market arrangements. And also an acknowledgement of a broad approach tackling the pandemic, including all sectors of society, to take all the, the different consideration into, um, into to concern. And I have to end on a more hopeful note that I hope that uh, the pandemic would start a debate about revitalization 
of the Nordic welfare state model and to see that uh, to, to meeting this unexpected pandemic sort of was quite revealing the, the, the problems that the, 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 this uh, recent development has had. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, we have uh, one question for you, but given that we are, um, time is quite advanced, you, I'm gonna just ask that we keep that question uh, for when we have a, a joint discussion. Um, I want to move on to our second speaker. Um, in fact, we have two questions coming up there about the evidence on inequities, which I think will be um, an important theme uh, for discussion. Um, so can we, however, hold those and then we'll move on to look at Paul's presentation. Paul's going to be talking about the future of public health policy making after COVID. Mm -hmm. So over to you, Paul, um, if you can load up your presentation. Sorry, I'm working between two computers here, so one for the... But please keep asking uh, the questions, whether you put them in the chat or the Q&A, and that's great. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Okay, thank you. So I, I'm about to give you a, a brief summary of uh, a paper just uh, produced by uh, the three authors you can see there. Um, now, it, it was essentially a review of uh, peer-reviewed publications on health and health policies, with a particular focus on studies that mention policy making in some way. So it, it's, um, it, it's, it's a relatively narrow focus, but it should be relevant here. So the, 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 um, the COVID connection, I think, is something that we did not find in the review, you know, because the papers go up to um, mid 2000. But uh, COVID is, is impossible to ignore in that context. And I think what we, we, we sort of use it as a hook to talk about the irony of COVID-19 in relation to health and all policies. So it, what we say is it should have bolstered the health and all policies case because there's already a high commitment to it, you know, to, to uh, public health policy and uh, health improvement. And COVID-19 has showed us the, the importance of the social determinants of inequality in this field. You know, um, there's a very strong relationship between things like uh, income and, and wealth and uh, levels of um, illness and mortality, for example. Yet what we found, particularly in the UK, but I think the WHO also produced a report on this that said uh, health departments and agencies have shifted their resources profoundly from health improvement or promotion to health protection. So that one's a little bit ironic because I think people in health promotion are used to being sidelined by you know, economic growth and that sort of thing, not, not by health protection. But um, it suggests in, in any case that the health and health policies logic is uh, sort of central to the work of people in public health, but it's not really central to the work of the people they seek to influence. And it shows us that the momentum for health and health policies can be lost at any time. And I think that kind of reinforces the the messages that we get from the, the review we produced. So I'll briefly go into some of the more relevant parts of this review. So we were, we're talking about 113 articles and there are sort of five parts to what I'll outline here. Uh, the first is you can find a remarkably common health and health policy story in these uh, articles, but, but also a little bit vague. Uh, most of these articles contribute to what we're gonna call a, a health and health policies playbook. You know, here's how you do it. Uh, but most also describe this dispiriting gap between what they want to do or what's adopted and what actually happens. And the, the importance of the Nordic experience, particularly in uh, the more studied countries like Norway and Finland, is that it provides this best case and cautionary tale. You know, it, it, um, you would expect health and health policies to work best in these countries. And the fact that you can find this limited progress is all the more uh, significant. And then we'll briefly talk about some of the reflections that people have had on that kind of experience. So, so um, we can go into this in more depth if it's not particularly clear, but I think this is a, sort of five steps you would take to describe what 
health and all policies is about. You start off by declaring that health is a human right. You identify evidence of the social determinants of health inequalities so that you can pursue health equity. You identify solutions which are evidence-based uh, so-called upstream solutions. And there, I think there's some debate on what upstream really refers to or which metaphor is best. Then you promote uh, multi-sectoral or intersectoral action and collaboration between people inside and outside government. And then you seek this high and enduring political commitment. So that should seem fairly uh, commonplace to people who already study health and no policies. Uh, we've also produced, I, th I think, what we call a playbook is really the seven most frequent or popular pieces of advice for people trying to turn high app adoption into action. So number one, use a model uh, like proposed, you know, step-by-step -step model produced by bodies like the WHO. Then raise awareness and connect high up to the agendas of other governments. You know, so this is really about uh, going beyond health to uh, finding common connections with uh, all relevant uh, other government agencies. Number three, I think, is, is probably the most popular recommendation. You know, seek win-win solutions. So that is adapting your health no policies agenda to those of other people. But at the same time, avoid the sense that health is interfering in the work of other bodies. Then ident identify policy champions, people who will, will, will push for, for policy change in key areas. Uh, promote the routine use of uh, health impact assessments to assess the health impact of other policies. And finally, some, not many, but some talk about not relying on the, the so-called economic case for health and all policies, because it's very difficult to justify investment in public health and health improvement in the ways that people normally do, you know, things like cost benefit, benefit analysis. Okay, so there's a kind of, there's a common story in a playbook. But then most studies talk about this dispiriting gap between the adoption of high app and its implementation. I think uh, most uh, tend to blame low levels of political will or, or commitment over time. Many highlight the role of uh, so-called neoliberal governments who would pay lip service to high app but have no real intentions of reforming their systems uh, to become more conducive to it. And I think the best example of that is South Australia, where it's one of the most studied. It is a government that has made the most high profile strategic commitment to high up, but it's also the one that shows uh, the kind of cautionary tale of limited progress, where there's this huge gap between a commitment to these kind of principles and policies that actually help deliver it. Okay, now I don't need to spend too much time on the Nordic experience because I think Professor Foss has sort of, uh, described the, the Norwegian experience. I'll just say that if you look at uh, studies of other countries, particularly Finland, they find similar, similar things. You know, the, um, uh, so these countries should be the best case in terms of their, 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 the conduciveness of their welfare state and uh, commitment to these kind of ideals. And that makes, uh, you know, progress limited progress seem all the more dispiriting. They also represent uh, decentralized models of high apps. So I know South Australia represents the, the sort of centralized strategic model. Uh, these countries are more decentralized. And what they tend to describe are these uh, differences in terms of uh, national local progress. So some of them, for example, say there's high national commitment backed by legislation uh, delegation to municipalities, but that, that, that's where you find this, this huge variation in, in progress or commitment. And finally, uh, you have different types of reflection on what to do about the things I've described. I think uh, most studies tend to focus on what I would call bullet point one there, which is when they draw on policy theories or, or studies of policy making, they're trying to improve the playbook I described, or they're, they're trying to improve their theory of change or their program logic. Whereas I think what we are trying to recommend is that they use policy theories and these uh, you know, uh, studied experiences to think differently about high app in, in that context. So I think what tends to come out are, you know, these are examples of the types of things that come out from that kind of study. So the first is to treat it like a, a continuous commitment rather than a, a tangible model. 
The second is to see implementation in different ways, because I think if you take high up seriously, it really suggests that uh, in some sense, there's no such thing as a high up implementation, because this is really just a set of principles and suggestions about how to work together. So it doesn't suggest that there is a necessarily a kind of a tangible uh, common goal at the end. It uh, suggests, now this one's my favorite, uh, you can draw on public administration studies to find how to better join up governments. Uh, but I think the study of public policy is more about revisiting what the logic is of uh, silos versus intersectoral action. So in, in a nutshell, I think lots of policy studies would say there's a strong rationale and logic for governments to maintain silos and they will not be overcome simply by a commitment to intersectoral action. You know, the driver for silo working is just as strong in government as say the driver for disciplinary research is strong in universities. And then a the final point would be to take uh, governance dilemmas seriously. I mean, we don't have much time to go into depth on what that means, but I think it, it essentially means that uh, there are trade-offs between the type of aims associated with high up. You know, one is, uh, you know, establish a kind of a, a uniform model, um, uh, formalize a commitment to high up in legislation and strategy documents. And the other is to be creative and work together and uh, have no agendas and that sort of thing. And uh, they really kind of rub up uh, difficult, you know, in a quite a difficult way in practice. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paul. That was that was great. Um, thank you also to the participants. I'm seeing another at least two questions emerging, which um, which will make for a very exciting discussion. In the interest of moving on and, and getting more material uh, for our discussion, I'll now turn to Asga. Um, Asga is going to talk more about consumer spending and, and looking at economic issues in the in the COVID response. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, thank you for inviting me here. So what I would like to tell you about is this specific research project that I've uh, worked on with my colleagues from the University of uh, Copenhagen. So um, I've learned a lot about uh, the health in all policies approach already today. Um, and what I'm about to tell you about is perhaps an example of the opposite. So you could say that this is more of a, uh, uh, the economy and public health policy type of, uh, of approach. Because it's quite clear that, um, that that public health policies that have been applied during the pandemic also have economic consequences. And being an economist, this is something that I'm, of course, uh, very interested in. So, um, in particular, uh, what uh, we are interested in here in this project is this uh, observation that governments around the world have introduced these mandated social distancing measures, also known as shutdowns or lockdowns, that shut down large parts of the economy, so including restaurants, bars, travel, retail shopping, and, and so on. And uh, I think it's fair to say that there is a quite popular view out there that, uh, that these shutdowns or lockdowns, that they do spread the, the, uh, the, the, they do slow the spread of the virus, so in that way, they save lives, but they're also extremely costly. So, uh, and because of this, uh, many people uh, believe that the government needs, uh, needs to balance these, this trade-off when they decide whether they want to close or reopen or, or even reclose their, their economies. And if you just look out and, and, and do a casual observation uh, across the world, you will see that, well, we haven't indeed seen massive declines in consumer spending. Uh, um, as governments have shut their economies down. And that seems to be consistent with, with this uh, popular, popular view. But, because there's a but here, uh, things are not necessarily that, that simple because what you, you need to, to, to realize is that there are really at least two things uh, that affect household spending and therefore the economy um, during a pandemic. So first, there, there are these policy measures introduced to contain the virus. So the shutdowns, lockdown policies that I've uh, just talked about. But there is also something else, which is the virus itself or the pandemic itself. And by that, I mean the 
the, uh, the behavioral changes that, that uh, the people uh, uh, take to avoid uh, contributing to the spread of the virus. So uh, basically the changes in behavior that, 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 that are, are voluntary in, that people make to, to, to avoid uh, being infected themselves and perhaps uh, to avoid uh, infecting others. And one thing that, 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 that's pretty clear is that this is actually quite hard to separate empirically. If you want to know how much is due to the policy measures and how much is due to this other direct effect of the virus, it's, it's actually quite hard. Why? Well, because these two, um, these two things, they, well, by design, they happen at the same time. So when do governments introduce shutdowns or lockdown measures? Well, they do so exactly at the time uh, when infection, rate, uh, infection rates are high. And, and that is true whether you look across time or across uh, space, across countries and so on. So it's really easy to confound the, the, the effects of, of these two uh, uh, things. So what I hope to convince you about in this short presentation is that in fact, most of the cont contractions that we've seen in spending are in fact due to this latter effect. So the direct effect of the virus itself. And that is, we would, even if governments had not uh, shut down their economies, to, their economies to the extent that they have, we would still have seen uh, large uh, drops in spending and therefore huge impacts on the economy. And then the second point is that um, if you look at particular groups of people, it might actually be that, that uh, shutdowns like this, well, because they help uh, slow the spread of the virus, they may actually increase spending for some groups, in particular those with high health risk, because it's simply by, spreading this, by slowing the spread of the virus, uh, it, it makes it safer for these people to, to, to leave their homes and interact with the, the rest of society. Okay. So let me tell you how we get to, to these conclusions. So what we do here is that we exploit as, uh, as we, a natural experiment, as we uh, like to call it uh, across the economist, that occurred in Scandinavia during this early, the early phase of the COVID-19 pandemic, that is in the spring of, of last year. So what we do is that we look at, the, at, the, uh, at Denmark and Sweden, two neighboring countries, and we believe that this is uh, an interesting comparison for at least two reasons. So one, um, these two countries, Denmark and Sweden, they're so similar in many ways, culturally, uh, politically, and so on. And very importantly for, for our purposes here is that uh, if you look at what the situation looked like back in the, in the very early days of the pandemic in, in February, uh, March last year, these two countries were actually initially exposed to COVID-19 in, in, the, in the same way. So they had their their first uh, confirmed cases almost on the same day. Uh, we can look at excess mortality figures, uh, Google searches on symptoms and so on and so on. It all looks very, very similar in the very early phase of the pandemic, that is February and early March last year. Uh, but despite these similar early experiences, then the two countries, uh, they responded very differently. So Denmark uh, more or less followed the, the rest of Europe and, and closed down large parts of the economy, while Sweden uh, quite famously did something uh, different. So they went for, for this so-called lighter touch approach um, where uh, um, many things were based on recommendations while most private businesses were allowed to, to continue to stay open. Oops, sorry. So what we do here is that we turn to the data. So we, uh, we have a collaboration with a large Scandinavian bank, that's Danske Bank, which is the largest bank in Denmark and the second largest in all of Scandinavia. Um, so we have data from about 800, 860,000 customers. And we use that to construct measures of, uh, of spending for, individ for each individual. And they are spread across uh, Denmark and Sweden. So what we do is that we compare the responses in Denmark versus those in Sweden. And then we interpret the difference between Denmark and Sweden as the causal effect of the shutdown. And it's important to say that this difference will then, will, will then capture two things. So um, there is the, the direct effect of the shutdown that is that because some shops or restaurants and so on are closed, 
there are things that you can no longer buy. So you cannot go down and, and buy a meal at a restaurant uh, in, in Denmark at this time. Um, so that's this, this direct effect. But there's also an indirect effect in to the extent that, that uh, this shutdown reduces the spread of the virus. Well, that will also have uh, an, an independent effect on, on behavior and therefore also on spending. And this could uh, be important also. And as I said, um, the estimates that we will uh, come up with will capture or will reflect both of these uh, indirect, direct and indirect effects. Okay, so let me jump to straight to, to the results. So what I'm showing you here, if you look at, at the top left corner here, what I'm showing you here is the, uh, the evolution of, of daily average spending for, for our bank customers in Denmark. And so the, the red curve here is from 2020 uh, and the, the gray one is from the previous year, that is 2019. So what you can see here is that daily spending is quite volatile. So it goes up and down a lot and there are clear systematic patterns so around uh, weekends and around uh, the end of, of each month. But what you can also see is that these are quite systematic. So if you compare the red one to the, to the gray one, you see that they're very, very similar. They track each other very closely in this period here before, before the pandemic really, really started in our part of the world. Uh, you see that they move very closely in parallel until this day, which is March 11th, uh, where the, the prime minister of Denmark uh, uh, announced the beginning of the shutdown in Denmark. And here you see divergence. So you see the red curve really falling below the, the gray one reflecting that we see a, a big drop in, in uh, consumer spending at this time. So, um, but what you can also see is that if you look at Sweden, which is down here, you see almost the exact same, same thing happening. So you, again, you see this parallel movement here reflecting that the spending uh, follows these, these systematic patterns and then divergence also on, at almost exactly the same date. And note that this is, as I said, this is uh, with, 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 despite this, this, um, this quite uh, uh, important uh, difference in policies between these two countries. So to summarize uh, the, these effects, we calculate the average difference here, and then we take a, uh, a, a into account that, that there's also something called economic growth. So in, on average, the red curve is a, a little bit above the, the gray one over here. But if we take that into account and we get this summary measure that uh, average over this period from, from the beginning of the shutdown until early April, we get that spending in household spending in Denmark fell by 29% uh, as a direct result of this pandemic. While if we look at Sweden, we see that despite the, the difference in policies, we see that the drop in Sweden is, is in fact almost as large. So at 25%. And the difference between the two, that's the blue bar down here. The difference between the two is uh, a mere 4%. And remember, this is uh, what we interpret as the effect of the shutdown. So that in Denmark, so that is the, if the, the, the extra drop in spending in Denmark that comes over and above the, the, the uh, effect of the pandemic itself that arises due to this uh, uh, Danish shutdown. So, quite small compared to this very drastic uh, drop in, in overall spending that we saw as a, as a direct result of the pandemic. So on average, uh, this number looks quite small, but if you zoom in on particular groups, you will see here, that, as we've done here, we look at age groups. So um, you'll see that this actually conceals quite dramatic differences uh, across different groups. So here we do exactly the same thing, but for different populations. So we do exactly the same thing for the young, uh, that is those from uh, age between 18 and 29. And here you see that we do in fact see quite large effect of the shutdown of 10%. Of, uh, uh, that is spending fell by 10 percentage points more in Denmark than in Sweden for this group. So this shows that for the young, shutting down the economy in this way actually has quite large consequences for their spending. On the other hand, if you look at the elderly, and as we know, the elderly are exactly those that are at, at, uh, at, um, 
uh, the, have the highest risk of, of getting seriously ill from COVID-19, you see the exact opposite. You, so here we see that the drop was actually bigger in Sweden than in Denmark. So while there's the, 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 the difference for the population as a whole is quite small as we saw up here, uh, the same thing is not uh, true when we look at different subpopulations. So it, it, there seems to be a, a quite big effect on who does the spending. So um, just so time is running here. So let me just tell you how we interpret these results. So as we've seen uh, the Danish shutdown when we compare it to the experience in Sweden, the, the shutdown in fact only explains a small fraction of the total drop in spending that we have seen during the early phase of the COVID-19 crisis. And our interpretation of that is that most of the drop in Denmark is in fact due to the pandemic itself. And it would have occurred even if we had followed a lighter touch approach as the one uh, taken in, in Sweden. Um, second, because when you shut down the economy, it really lowers the spending of the young. And as we've seen, the young uh, tend to have a quite big role in, in driving the epidemic. So uh, because of that, um, it may help reducing the spread of the virus. And this makes it safer to, for, for those who are most at risk to uh, interact more with society. And that therefore, we've, we, well, that's one, our interpretation at least, um, this enables more economic activity by high risk groups such as the elderly. Okay, so I think my time is up, so I will uh, stop here. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Um, again, we have some lovely questions coming up and we are going to address all of them. I'm making a, a good note of them. Um, but we first have uh, another two presentations to, to put on the table and then we'll have a lovely discussion. So thanks, Paul. Uh, um, sorry, thanks, Asuka. I'm now going to move on to Oli and then Oli will be followed by Heli. So Oli's going to look at... Um, the renewed public health policy in Sweden and, and how things have evolved uh, with the pandemic under that context of their new policy on social determinants. All right, thank you very much. And thank you for having me here at this uh, very interesting webinar. Uh, I was planning to fairly briefly describe the, the development of a, the public health policy framework in Sweden um, and uh, say something about how I think it has um, uh, intervened or played along with, with the COVID crisis. Um, as several people have already mentioned, the social determinants of health uh, framework has become the framework for understanding health inequalities during the past 15 or 20 years or so. And, and, and it's a, a framework, I think, that uh, enables us to, to put in a lot of different types of res research into an overarching and unifying framework uh, that contains a range of conditions that affect health throughout life. Uh, uh, and these conditions are often uh, also unequally distributed, with, which contributes to, to health inequalities. Uh, this way of thinking about uh, health and, and health promotion in a wider sense uh, it's not entirely new, of course, it can trace it back to the Ottawa Charter and, and even further back. Uh, it has been a key part of the Swedish public health policy since the early 2000s. Uh, at the same time, we have seen that inequalities in health have increased in, in Sweden or during this period, as have other types of inequalities, as Elizabeth man mentioned. Uh, so uh, we had sort of a rethinking in Sweden. So the, the public health policy was reformulated in 2018 by decision of the parliament. And, and this parliamentary decision was based on a government bill, uh, which in turn was based on the proposals from the Swedish Commission for Equity and Health that I was, was um, honored to be the chair of. Uh, the overarching objective with the updated framework uh, 
is has two parts really. So the first part is to create societal conditions for good and equitable health in the whole population. Uh, and the second part is to close the avoidable health gaps in a generation. And I think these um, two parts, and in particular, particular the, the second part that puts sort of a, a time frame to actions has been very crucial. Uh, this overarching objective is uh, accompanied by eight objective areas. These areas, um, they, they range across an, a number of sectors uh, and they are pointed out as important for interventions and follow-up. And they are really framed in people's lives throughout the, the life course. So it's areas, key areas that reflect conditions and opportunities that are important for people's health and well-being across the life course. So you can see this is an illustration that the Public Health Agency of Sweden has, has um, uh, taken, taken forward. So you can see it's the eight areas contain early life conditions, uh, education and skill formation, work, working conditions, working life issues, income, uh, economic maintenance, housing and neighborhood conditions, uh, health behaviors, of course, um, participation in society in democratic um, uh, bodies, uh, and health care. And all these things are, are, are playing out across the life course. Uh, and the bottom line, I think, or, or at least that was what, was what we meant with it in the commission, was that more equal conditions and opportunities, opportunities across all of these areas uh, will uh, bring reduced health inequalities in the end. And I think one of the crucial messages that we had from the commission and that was taken up in the governmental bill was also that these, all these areas are, are mutually in, interdependent. They affect each other. So problems uh, during education, and uh, if you're not fulfilling your, your schooling, you will have uh, lower skills, you will have more difficulties to getting into the labor market, you will have bigger difficulties in, in earning an income and uh, having housing, etc., etc. So, So there are, are uh, a lot of interdependencies uh, going on in these areas. And of course, you, you need to have different types of policies across different types of sector to, to alleviate and, and the problems and, and to foster good conditions for people. Uh, now, now, this was decided by the parliament in, in mid-2018, uh, so there has been one and a half year, basically. Uh, so it's maybe too early to, to say something about how it has worked, but but some observations uh, from my part, at least, I would say that with this change in the overarching uh, agenda and, and the change in overarching goal, some momentum has been gained in Sweden. Uh, the inclusion of a time frame makes the goal or the objective, overarching objective, much clearer. It also means in Sweden we had the the the, the uh, regulations that if the parliament has set an objective or an overarching goal, then the government must report on it in every budget. So this means that when you have a time frame for for the goal, it the the report reporting back from the, the government to the parliament becomes much more focused. Uh, as part of the package, there has also been a new role for the public health agency to, to much more clearly um, oversee the, the combined efforts, which uh, hasn't really been put through yet, but it, it's, it's on its way. And, and the public health agency has also worked with a support structure for monitoring and follow-up, which I, th I think is very promising, as, uh, although it hasn't been, been into, put into work as yet. Still, there is a challenge which has, has been brought up by several other speakers to catch the attention of other sectors who often have, have their hands full anyway. Um, but I would also like to mention that the alignment with the 2030 agenda is helpful, uh, in particular since the parliament has also taken an overarching uh, goal or objective for the implementation, uh, where leave no one behind is specially mentioned, which is of course in, in line with combating health inequalities. Now, uh, as several others had touched upon already, uh, 
public health during the COVID crisis or the uh, public health has been pushed to the forefront in, in a way that we haven't seen for many, many years. I mean, one of the downsides is, is all of the hobby epidemiologists that, that have come up. Uh, but I think it has been important that COVID has demonstrated the links between health, work, welfare systems and economic performance in a very brutal way, if you like. Um, and I think there is an opportunity to use these insights also for, for chronic diseases and, and in the aftermath of the pandemic. It is also the case that the Swedish Public Health Agency has actively used this wider policy framework when they have argued for their COVID recommendations. So for example, they, uh, they were very strongly against closing primary and lower secondary schools, and they were then actively pointing to the public health effects closing schools would have in particular for, for children in, in, in poor social uh, areas or, or, or families with violence, etc. So just rounding up the, this very brief uh, introduction and presentation of the Swedish case, um, I, I would like to say and, and that uh, I think that the social determinants of health framework has been very successful in principle. It's it's all over the place in you know different kinds of reports and, and policy thinking in, in principle, but it hasn't gained so much momentum in practice. Uh, and one of the problems I think is the difficulty to communicate to other sectors. Um, as soon as other sectors hear the word health, they think that it's it's a, it's a matter for the Department of Health. Very often, I would also say that the recommendations from commissions have been fairly unspecific, and there has been a lack of priority settings that is necessary to have in, in real life politics and policy making. Uh, this applies to Sweden as well, but I think that the love, past few years have we have seen some small steps of change. Um, and as I mentioned before, I think that that there is a slightly different narrative in the new framework that has had slightly better appeal to different sectors. And the new goal with a specific time frame is, is really, really helpful. Uh, and not least, I think that the pandemic has demonstrated the interdependencies between the economy, between people's health, between people's uh, trust, between, between society as a whole and, 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 and how different parts of society work together. And I think that uh, it's going to be important to keep that insight alive uh, for, the, for the years to come. So by that, I thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thanks, super, Oli. That was, that was really great and kept 100% of time. Um, we're now moving on to our final speaker, who um, We've been, uh, who's going to really address the economy of well-being uh, head on, I would say, from uh, someone who's working um, in policy making from that perspective. Um, so I'm handing over now to Heli, and then we, we, we should have quite a good amount of time to address, I can see at least eight to 10 questions that have come up that, that will we'll cluster around certain themes for certain of the presenters. Thank you. Heli, over to you, if you can load up your presentation. Yeah, th thank you very much. Uh, I think that I have to close my camera during my, my presentation because the uh, connection is a little bit poor, but okay, it did it already. Okay, so just a minute. So now I think that you can you can see my presentation. Mm -hmm. If not, let, let me know. Uh, so uh, yes, I'm going to to um, uh, give a, another viewpoint, or or actually what I have heard already, very interesting presentations, and um, and and uh, I think that uh, I have a lot of connections to those those things you have already raised uh, up in in this present in this uh, seminar. Uh, uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the background, uh, uh, 
uh, how we have uh, decided to develop uh, uh, economy of well-being uh, thinking in Finland and also uh, what kind of uh, possibilities and challenges uh, we have faced during the COVID-19 and uh, how health in all policies approach, ap approach has uh, mm, helped us and what kind of solutions we have found and also some future future steps. Um, the background, um, actually we have uh, heard a lot of uh, examples from Nordic countries and uh, uh, I, I have to say that also the uh, background uh, of the uh, economy of well-being uh, is uh, is uh, very strongly in Nordic welfare model because it gives a very strong emphasis on building a welfare state uh, through fiscal policies, through legislation, and also through contract society. Another approach, uh, which is uh, very much uh, uh, in in the background of the economy of well-being thinking is health in all policies approach because i very well recognize uh, those things ole ole just uh, uh, raised up in his presentations that sometimes it's uh, it's uh, very difficult to to get the other uh, sectors um, uh, involved and interested in health but uh, we have noticed that uh, economy of well-being is also one tool to implement health in all policies approach because uh, uh, we have a long history in Finland uh, in development of the health in all policies approach and uh, and uh, uh, as we have heard uh, uh, it also it's it's important because it uh, uh, gives us tool to discuss about the health determinants and their distribution and uh, I also want to mention One Health uh, uh, approach because the global health security has been one of those things we have uh, been very much uh, interested in Finland and we have been very much uh, developed those also. And uh, as we have heard, uh, Agenda 2030 is, uh, is a very important tool to, to implement um, uh, cross-sectoral work and, and implement a health in all policies approach in, in the practice uh, at national level. Uh, and uh, based on this work and based on a, a kind of combination of these different kind of approaches, uh, uh, Finland um, uh, during the presidency uh, of EU, uh, Finland uh, uh, launched the Council conclusions on the economy of well-being and the aim uh, was uh, uh, to strengthen the horizontal and, and holistic discussion at EU, EU level because there, there uh, uh, it was lacking there. And um, uh, right after that um, we, we also, <laughs> two years after the Swedish, uh, Sweden, uh, we also, uh, after five-year work, uh, the, gov the government uh, decided that long-term measures for reducing the inequalities in well-being, health and safety. So, so these are kind of um, story uh, uh, you can follow that uh, how we how it goes in in practice and and how it goes in in the policy making at at the, at the government level. And uh, as we had actually heard quite well, um, we think that. Uh, 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 also, uh, and I, I very much share the idea that uh, COVID-19 crisis has actually uh, uh, showed us that, that there is a very strong link between, between well-being, health and, and the economy. And, uh, and uh, this is, has been also discussed uh, uh, at government level in Finland and um, it has not been very easy discussion, I have to say, uh, but uh, we have, uh, we have uh, uh, 
succeed to, to uh, make some uh, uh, phrase, <laughs> some some uh, targets or or some goals or or strategies uh, how we want to to uh, rebuild uh, after the crisis and and. One is that uh, we really need that uh, well-being, health, and economy must be taken into uh, in, into account, and and uh, especially the the link between them, and uh, and also in the long term, we think that uh, the uh, the economy of well-being need to be promoted uh, uh, more strongly, and and. Uh, and also, uh, what we think is that we need a uh, national model uh, to uh, comprehensive assessment of well-being and the implementation of, of the economy of well-being uh, in Finland. But as I said, uh, these discussions ha hasn't been very, very uh, easy. And, um, and I think that, uh, for example, those um, that not Knowledge we are we are uh, getting and and uh, uh, research, research results we are getting all the time. It helps us because because uh, uh, I think that every week or every month we get uh, more more evidence that uh, how what is the link between between these uh, and and that that support us to to go on. So. Uh, some uh, some things we have uh, learned. Uh, I already uh, mentioned. Uh, I, I know that Professor Elizabeth Foster said that uh, uh, there has been also um, uh, that uh, Nordic welfare model haven't succeed very well. Um, our opinion is a little bit different because we then think that uh, um, we know that we have. Uh, mm, we have not succeed. For example, in Finland, uh, the uh, those people who are in vulner vulnerable uh, situation, the crisis has hit them more than others. But um, still, we think that uh, we have uh, uh, in in a rather good situation in 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 Nordic countries and 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 at least in Finland. Uh, but. Um, um, what we have been discussing last summer actually and uh, 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 was the very long uh, discussion about uh, how to strengthen the resilience in, in society and uh, I think that the role of health in all policies approach is it's very important because um, it gives us um, a kind of uh, uh, structure to, to cross-sectional uh, work between different uh, sectors and uh, and um, uh, what we found uh, and uh, uh, where we need to uh, improve and and uh, and uh, um, I, I hope that after this crisis uh, if there is going to be next one we we are going to uh, develop these uh, areas so one is that uh, what we need to develop is that um, we need to develop coordination and, and kind of flexibility. Um, in the beginning, uh, there were a lot of silos, but I think that uh, um, uh, because people uh, started to think uh, based on the health in all policies thing uh, approach, so it helped uh, make make the decision making and coordination uh, easier. Uh, this was uh, one of our mm, uh, difficulties anyway. And um, an another thing is that uh, what we what we need, uh, and uh, uh, is that we need to have uh, a stronger knowledge base and uh, actually up to date situational situational picture, because the decision making um, uh, needs uh, um, more uh, up to date knowledge uh, uh, to to uh, to be flexible and and effective and uh, then uh, what is uh, also important is that uh, where we weren't very effective uh, was the consistent timely and high quality communication uh, also the the communication um, between uh, uh, different uh, sectors, but also communication and, and uh, kind of information uh, to, the, to the people and citizens. 
And I think that the, the role of uh, health in all policies approach, uh, and if we, uh, we, we should use that uh, kind of uh, thinking and, and uh, ways of uh, working more effectively to, to find out, uh, to respond to these things in the, in the future. And um, then I just uh, take some final notes. Uh, uh, where are we now? Uh, those were more like a problems and uh, not so success stories. But uh, these are maybe the next steps. And, and uh, I think that how I, I want to, to anyway uh, give some, some positive <laughs> signs what we, what we are going to do. And uh, also uh, to show that um, uh, this working together uh, is, is, uh, is what we need to, to continue also in, the fin also in Finland. So, um, we used the economy of well-being at, at, at this time to implement health in all policies approach because it's uh, it's now accepted and it's um, there is a place for that and um, we have a, a cross-sectional group uh, where we have uh, uh, people from different ministries and also our uh, ad advisory board on the public health, national advisory board on the public health, they have a sub subcommittee to support the development and implementation of economy of well-being. And, uh, and we also need to implement uh, this uh, approach at different levels and, uh, and uh, a more concrete uh, way is to, to develop state budget, budget uh, to follow thematic approaches of well-being, for example, child uh, and, and gender budgeting. So these are the next steps, uh, what, what we are going to do. And actually, I, uh, this is my personal opinion, but I think that uh, uh, actually the COVID crisis, because it had so showed that, that there are so strong links between uh, economy and health and well-being. Uh, it has given us a kind of uh, boosting to, to go further with these uh, issues. Thank you. Uh, I skipped this one, this one. Thank you. Super. Thank you very much, Heli. Um... Well, um, welcome to the last, uh, I would say we have just under, just over 15 minutes, maybe just under 20 minutes. Um, so now I'm going to dive into some of those really interesting questions uh, that have been posted. And I'm going to take us back to a cluster of questions around inequities in health or inequalities in health and whether they've increased in the Nordic countries during the time of COVID. Um, and then th there was a question on that and asking why they've increased. So if, if I could ask, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit flexible here. I'm going to turn, although that question was raised um, to Elizabeth, I'm sure, for example, Ollie would have something to say and possibly one or two of the other speakers. But just for, for the record, if you could just state the, the evidence on the inequities in health that have increased in the Nordic countries and perhaps restate, I think some of the, the, the reasons why, which um, Elizabeth, you mentioned, uh, I think in your, in your presentation. So who of the panelists would like to address that question? I could, I could start since uh, sure. what I was talking about. I just wanted to say to Haley that I really, I'm sorry if I made the uh, impression that I think that the Nordic countries has been tackling the pandemic badly, because I think that some of the strength of the Northern model has really shown. That was I was trying in one my slide, but I think also, you know, the undermining of the Nordic model has also showed the weaknesses. That was sort of what I wanted to say. Um, I, so far as I know, I don't think at least to my knowledge, that we have numbers showing increase in social inequalities during the pandemic. But that there has been, there are sort of, you can find numbers almost everywhere. I said that my reference was to uh, a Nordic government paper showing that the development over the last 10 years about, you know, increasing inequalities 
in health in the Nordic countries. And that is also been by uh, uh, the scholars sort of connected to this the change in sort of in the economy. And, and we can see that uh, that, that is uh, that as since the 1980s, the social inequalities has increased. But I also think that we could expect an increase after COVID because of what we see, uh, the groups that are being laid off work. That is, we who are uh, employed at, uh, from the government and therefore universities, I think we are quite safe. But people who work in bars and restaurants in, in institutions that have insecure uh, work, working conditions, they are the worst hit. And um, if they are not supported to come back both the businesses and the people, then I think we can expect an increase in unemployment. At least in Norway, we have a very high increase in unemployment and we see that there are social inequalities in these unemployment figures. Thank you. Should I turn also off my camera now or only mute? I can do both. Um, up, up, up to you, maybe um, I'm gonna, I think dive into another question. So if, if one of the other panelists want to, to look at it, um, please feel free. It was a little bit oriented towards um, Paul and Ollie, perhaps, um, and to some degree, Heli. Um, but before I move there, which I'm really going to look at the health and all policies practice and the, um, the well-being model that Heli was talking about. But before going there, I think there was a, a lot of uh, pointed questions around Paul's, um, not Paul's, Asger's presentation. Um, and related to that, there was a broader question about whether the light touch approach was pro-equity or not. But before coming to, to that question, I want to ask Asga, um, was, were the, was it a good thing or a bad thing um, that the higher risk groups, which were only defined um, by age, not, uh, not by other socioeconomic uh, risk factors, but was it a good thing or bad thing uh, in your view or considered in the country by the politicians who've seen your results that there was higher and there was less of an impact on the expenditure of the elderly. Um, over to you. Asuka? Um, I think it's hard to say whether it's a good or a bad thing. I think it's, uh, I think it says something about the, the distribution of the burden of the, of the entire pandemic that um, those that are most, most at risk uh, health-wise um, in, in Sweden, it seems the, the fact that there is no, uh, has been no hard shutdown means that they are also the ones who have to carry the largest burden in terms of uh, self-isolating and reducing uh, their, their spending. Um, whereas with the approach, with the so, sort of harder approach that Denmark, many other countries have, mm. have adopted, you see a different distribution of, of the burden. So, so here, a, the, you're really forcing the young to, to cut back and to behave differently than they otherwise would. And therefore they perhaps carry a larger share of the burden, uh, which then allows the, the, the older part of the population to, uh, to act more freely. Uh, that's, that's, that's how we interpret this at least. And whether that's a good or a bad thing, I think is hard to say. Uh, I mean, that depends on when you're on your point of view. Um, so from, from, from a pandemic, from a health perspective, I, I think that we, we can look at, I think that was also included in one of the questions, we can look at, so what is it then that they do in, in Denmark that they don't do to the same extent in Sweden, the, the elderly? Mm -hmm. And here we see that it's, so it's, it's mainly sort of medium uh, social contact type of spending. So it's, it's like high street shopping um, has fallen a lot more in for the elderly in, in Sweden than in Denmark, it's public transportation and so on. So it's not restaurants and, and, and theaters and, and, and bars and stuff that, 
where you would expect a very high degree of social proximity, but it's, it's sort of in the mid-range. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that. And then perhaps a more provocative question just to throw out to the panel. I, I don't know who, who would like to answer this, but the question was, do, do we think that the light touch approach of Sweden was better for equity or not? Given perhaps the distribution of mortality and morbidity in the, um, in the Nordic countries. Um, oh, well, I, yeah, I anyone say, I, would want to deal with that? Well, well I can Andy? start to say something. Mm -hmm. I, I think, I think it's important to remember that light touch or, or hard touch in many ways it, it will be fairly similar. Um, I mean even if you have a lockdown you will need staff in the hospitals and in the healthcare and the old age home to go to their work. Uh, you would need transportation to operate etc etc. So, so for a lot of people with low paid um, physically heavy occupations the, 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 the they will be the same basically basically but in one important area i think that is the light touch has been pro equity and that is because we kept schools open in in sweden so uh, pupils up to the age of 15 could still go to schools which i think in the long run will, will be very important uh, if you've been home for there are some british figures showing that mm -hmm. that uh, there is a clear gradient that you, you have lost traction in, in school, you have lost up to six months of, of, of learning uh, am among the poorer segments, um, uh, where you have lost virtually nothing among the, 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 the wealthier segments of the population. And, and I think in the long term building of human capital and chances in the future, this will prove very, very pro equity. Super, thanks for addressing that uh, difficult question. Um, now, moving on to the practice of um, health in all policies, there was a question which said, if you're not using an economic argument, uh, which arguments can you use? And I throw that question out to, um, to Paul and then possibly to Heli, because she did refer to some of the issues to do with communication and the, the discussions, difficult discussions they were having around the connection between health the economy and this area of well-being, which uh, a few people have already asked, well, what indicators are you using? How are you defining it? Uh, do we mean basically everything else that makes life worth living apart from health itself and, and having a successful economy? So throwing over to um, starting off with, if we're not using an economic argument to justify uh, what arguments are we using? What did you mean by that, Paul? If I could ask you to address that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I mean, I should say that there's a real, um, there are two ways to interpret what I was trying to say. I, I think one way to interpret it is to say that it is relatively difficult to provide a, an economic or a cost benefit case for health and health policies. I think that's what, what uh, some of these articles were saying not not that they'd found an answer to that but they had identified the problem of of uh, of, of selling health and health policies to people who were uh, using you know traditional measures uh, there are, there are maybe two or three examples i think in south australia i think they describe um the the idea that health and policies could solve a major surge uh, or overload of health service capacity you know, so that was not so much an economic case, but a public service capacity case. You know, I mean, however true it is, I think it, it, it had some traction. Another solution, which is much less, uh, will be a bit more dispiriting, which is one article suggests that you should sell health and all policies units as very inexpensive. You know, uh, you, you may not care about it that much, but it's not going to cost you too much. And I, th and I think... The, the issue that they raised with that is that if if you sell it as not really costing too much, uh, it, it's not going to be valued particularly highly either. The, the third one I think might uh, be more associated with the UK is this idea of selling things as a, a social return to investment. That um, there was a time in the UK when uh, organisations were encouraged to, to essentially say, if you spend a pound on this thing, you will get the equivalent of £10 back. Uh, you won't actually get the money, 
but you'll get the equivalent of a service or value for money. Now that that worked for a little while, that had some traction a little while in the in the treasury, but it also became devalued over time because organizations were increasingly inflating the claims they made for the amount of returns you would get. And they were very difficult to substantiate. So actually over time, the treasury started to say that they were more interested in so-called cashable savings than social returns. You know, so there are some, there, there, kind of, there, there are kind of some examples, but I don't think that you would describe them as, you know, great solutions. Yes, maybe I continue. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, very, good very good examples already. Uh, uh, I think that uh, because the, if the question was that uh, what kind of arguments we use if we don't uh, use the, uh, um, to, to if you don't use the economic uh, uh, point point of view, but I think that uh, uh, in Finland what we what we have already noticed um, is that uh, if we want to put uh, health and well-being. Uh, as a as a uh, center of the decision making, uh, we need to also have these um, economic uh, uh, viewpoints uh, all all the time, all the time there, because uh, it's impossible to to um, um, how do you say. Uh, <laughs> it's impossible to, to get our decision maker, makers to make the decisions only about the health or, or well-being, uh, in, in, especially in these times uh, when, when uh, uh, government budget is a, is a very um, uh, tight, as I said. So it's, it's uh, important to so, show them that uh, uh, when well-being increases, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tool to increase the economy and also the long-term uh, sustainability in, in, in society. So, um, uh, but as, as Paul said, uh, we need more tools to, to show those inter, interlinks and that's why uh, what we try to do next in, in Finland is that uh, we develop uh, that uh, kind of a system uh, to, to uh, a database and system to, to use the economy of well-being approach uh, in a, in a sta stage budget that that is our, our next goal so we need to really combine these uh, more in a, in a more stronger way. Um, Heli, while I've got you there, just one to squeeze in one last question. In these discussions that you're having about the connections between health of the population, the economy and well-being, and you, you're trying to find a way to connect the two, um, what, how is the conversation on privatization, deregulation, neoliberal employment, globalization, how is that being viewed or being brought into the discussion when um, uh, Elizabeth sort of showed it as quite in quite a, a negative light and that has been undermining the Nordic model? And it, it's a great pressure in, in, in many contexts which don't start off with the kind of model that you have, which we believe has uh, reduced some of the inequities uh, that have been viewed um, uh, in the data. I would say Asger's presentation, he commented to be privately that they didn't see a socioeconomic difference in expenditures, which was interesting, at least in the short term. So uh, over to you, Heli, about these more um, bigger drivers in society. How have these been discussed, if at all? Uh, yes, they they have uh, they have been discussed all the time. I, I have to say, and it's um, uh, when we, for example, when we make the the uh, kind of plan, uh, recovery plan, uh, and and uh, it was uh, it was uh, uh, kind of the one of those. Uh, uh, packages we we needed to 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 evaluate and and make kind of impact assessment uh, that what kind of um, uh, uh, global um, uh, changes there might be and and uh, what kind of uh, how how do they affect uh, uh, for example to our recovery plan and. Uh, and um, how, how I can, I have to say that it's uh, it's all the time there. So uh, in in um, uh, um, 
we it, it, this is my my viewpoint maybe it's it's because uh, where i where i work it is um, it is the we have a very close connection uh, to the the, the uh, international uh, issues uh, but uh, the, uh, it's um, it's uh, built inside, I have to say. So, so we have to think. Finland is a very small country, so so we cannot separate ourselves uh, from 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 the EU or from the the, the uh, eastern uh, eastern countries or so. So that's why it's it's all the time there. So we have to think about that. Uh, what kind of uh, uh, trends or policies are, are in the in the other countries and and uh, at global level. So so it's in, inside. This is. Uh, this is maybe difficult to, to answer, but hopefully <laughs> you get some, some of your points. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, we um, we didn't have time to address all the questions, but I, I think you'll agree with me that um, th that there were these questions really helped to stimulate a, a critical discussion. Uh, I didn't get on to the one about um, the lack of um, tools for prioritization or really about why there was a gap in implementation. There was an interesting question about the overburdened um, public health uh, public health sector and perhaps that relates to privatization, deregulation and so on. So there were many more discussion, dis uh, questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to everything, but I would really like to take this opportunity to thank the panel and for closing remarks, I'm going to turn over to my colleague, Laurie Kokinen. Over to you, Laurie, and thank you to everyone. Okay, thank you, Nicole. So uh, we are running behind the schedule, so I will be very concise. So my name is Lauri Kokkinen and I work as a research director at the Tampere University in Finland. And um, now it's been my great pleasure to be part of the organizing team and um, really an honor to be among such uh, accomplished experts in, in this webinar. And I believe that um, having these five presentations from different viewpoints together with the lively open discussion led by Nicole was a good strategy for, for this event. And uh, uh, also, I think that in this um, quite intensive one and a half hours, we, we have been able to set light on the linkages between the uh, social determinants of health, uh, health in all policies, and the economy of well-being, and also to discuss the many challenges and opportunities for these uh, approaches in times of the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, uh, as we heard, there have been uh, uh, this kind of win-win uh, situations, as well as uh, conflicts between different policy sectors. And uh, during the pande pandemic, uh, many of the governments have uh, really taken health and, and well-being into account in their policies. Uh, many governments have uh, many governments have uh, posed uh, strict measures for, for social distancing, etc, uh, that have clearly surpassed many other important, impacts and values uh, such as individual freedom and economic impacts uh, but at the same time as we also heard from today's presentations the uh, the governments have also shifted resources away from uh, health promotion and uh, preventive measures to finance this uh, health protection and the war against the covid 19. so um uh, all in all, I, I believe this was uh, our, our web webinar was a good addition to the ongoing discussions on health, uh, social protection, equity, uh, politics and the economy in, in times of the pandemic. And uh, I would just once again like to thank all our uh, presenters for their valuable effort. And I would also like to thank all our organizers, uh, Marianne and Milen from the Global Network, Network for, for Health in All Policies. Mm -hmm. Then Mary, Karen, Mira and Timo from our Tampere University team. 
and of course Nicole from the uh, World Health Organization for making this webinar possible. And, and then finally, thank you all for taking part in this webinar. I think we had, have had some uh, 150 participants and, and it's really been a pleasure being with all, all of you today. So thank you all for your patience and um, I wish you all a very good evening. Um, or morning, depending on where you are. And bye-bye. Uh, bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, bye. 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 Bye from the panel. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.